we're in the middle of a, of a sermon series we're calling Back to the Basics. We're just kind of going back to the foundation of our Christian faith and, and examining uh, kind of those, those basic issues of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And last week we talked about prevenient grace and how God loves us first. And, and that's kind of the, the beginning of, of our journey with God is that God reaches out and gathers us in and God gives us His love first. And today I want us to look at John 3.16. There's not any more scripture that's more basic than that. But I want to put John 3.16 in context for us today and see that it takes place uh, as part of a conversation that Jesus was having with a guy named Nicodemus. And so listen to what the Scripture says, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3 of, of the book of John. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and, and he, he attempts to make some small talk. Jesus, uh, no one could do the things that you're doing if they weren't from God. Boy, we hear that you're a great guy. And Jesus just kind of cuts to the chase. And, and you see Jesus answering there in verse 3. I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Jesus knew what was, what was really on Nicodemus' heart. And it wasn't small talk. Nicodemus was, was wondering, how can I see the kingdom of God? How can I participate in the rule and reign of God? How can I know that God has accepted me? Now, the one thing that you have to give Nicodemus credit for is Nicodemus is concerned with something that really matters in life. I mean, think about all the stuff that you got excited about this week. All the things you worried about this week. All the things you kind of milled over this week. You know, was any of it that important in the grand scheme of things? And yet Nicodemus comes to Jesus because he's concerned about something that really matters here. How can I know that I am accepted by God? And to understand why this is kind of a funny question for Nicodemus to ask, you have to understand who Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were known for their uh, keeping of the law. Not only did they keep the law that was written in the Scripture, but they kept all the laws that were interpretations of the laws. And there were thousands upon thousands of laws that Nicodemus was keeping. And not only that, Nicodemus was at the top of his class. Nicodemus was one of the 70 uh, Pharisees on the Jewish ruling council. I mean, here's a guy who was really, really good at doing what he was supposed to be doing. And if I had to pick one word for Nicodemus, it would be good. If I had to pick two words for Nicodemus, it would be very good. I mean, here was a guy who was doing all the right things. He was doing it all. Is going and doing it, going to worship and, and tithing and helping out poor people, all of those things. But you know the problem with trying to work your way into being accepted by God. When our acceptance by God is based on our works, we're always left with one question. And the question is this Am I good enough? Am I good enough? And that's what Nicodemus is wondering Am I good enough? enough? Have I done all the right things? I, have, I, have I dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's? Have I done everything that I should, should do? Am I good enough when I get to heaven and, and I go to St. Peter's gates and will he look at my resume and say, hey, man, wow, look at all the great stuff you've done. Come on in. I mean, am I good enough? And those of us who are trying to work ourselves into God's good graces are always stuck with that question, am I good enough? And for all of us who have ever wondered that, we need to hear Jesus' response. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Then again in verse 5, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Now it's interesting here that Jesus precedes both of those, those phrases with, I tell you the truth. Most of the time when we say that, 
Uh, we say, hey, this time I'm telling you the truth. We say it because we lie all the time. And we want somebody to know that this time I'm telling the truth, right? And you say, man, I'm, I'm telling the truth this time. But Jesus wasn't in the habit of lying, was he? In fact, he never lied. He always told the truth. So when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, he's not saying it in, you know, in contrast to all those lies I told you. Jesus is saying, hey, guys, you really need to listen to this. This is the heart of the matter. I really want you to pay attention. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you can't be good enough to enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how many laws you keep. It doesn't matter how many times you come to worship. It doesn't matter how much scripture you read. It doesn't matter how many old ladies you help across the street. It doesn't matter how much money you give. You can't be good enough to enter the kingdom of God. To enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. This confused Nicodemus. He said, well, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to climb back into my mom again? <laughs> Jesus tells him again, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the Spirit, unless there's a spiritual rebirth that takes place. You can't be good enough. That's what Jesus is trying to say. And so in verse, verses 5 through 15, Jesus kind of admonishes Nicodemus. He says, man, God, you know, here you're a ruler of the people. You stayed the scripture and you don't get this. And then we come to to chapter 3, verse 16, as, as part of this whole conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus over what can I do to see the kingdom of God. And in, in, in chapter 3, 16 is when Jesus answers the question for Nicodemus. He says, all right, here, here, here it is, Nicodemus. All right, right here, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is how it happens. You believe in Jesus Christ. It's not by your works. It's not by how good you are. It's not by all the nice things you're doing. It's not by keeping the law. It's by believing in Jesus Christ. The way to the kingdom is not by keeping the law. It's by believing in Jesus. And the question that all of us ought to ask ourselves is this. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? I mean, that's the most important question of life, isn't it? I mean, this is, this is the question, all of us, if we get nothing else right in life, this is the question we want to get right. All of eternity hinges on this. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Life, security, peace, joy, it hinges on that question right there. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? And, and we need to make sure we understand that because I'm afraid that a lot of people in our culture today are getting it wrong. I'm afraid that a lot of Christians in our churches are getting it wrong. They don't understand what it means to believe in Jesus. Jesus himself said, he said that, that at the end of time, there's going to be lots of people who say, Jesus, Jesus, hey man, we're, we're your buddies. And Jesus is going to say, I didn't know you. I don't know who you are. There are people who, who thought they were getting it right by doing the right things. And Jesus is going to say, man, I don't, you know, I don't know you. We need to get this right. And we've been taught sometimes in some places, I think, a definition of belief that doesn't match up with what Jesus says. See, a lot of us have learned that belief looks something like this. Rachel, you want to go to hell? You don't? <laughs> All right, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? All right, here's a one-way ticket to heaven. Non-refundable. Done. Boom. Bam. Feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. Chris, you want to go to hell? No. All right. You believe just down the cross for your sins? One way ticket to heaven. Non-refundable. Boom. Have a great life. That feels good, doesn't it? I mean, now you got your ticket. You can do what you want. You can get you one of those bumper stickers on your car that says Christians are, are, aren't, 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 uh, aren't perfect, just forgiven. Right? Because I mean, now you know you've got your ticket. You can do whatever you want. And man, how it feels good when you realize, you know what, I've got my ticket to heaven in my back pocket back here. And now that I've got my ticket to heaven, I can go on my life and do what I want. And whatever I do, God has to forgive me now. I've got one of these. Y'all have one of these? And when you have one of these, you can do what you want because God has to forgive you every time you ask. You get it and can just go about your life and do what you want. Now it feels great to get your ticket to heaven, put it in your back pocket. Just go about life, right? I mean, isn't that what it sounds like sometimes to you? 
that hey, if you just, if you maybe if you just say the prayer, and if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, man, you got that ticket, and now you can go about and do whatever you want in life. It just, man, it just relieves you of the burden of wondering what's going to happen to me when I die. Life's so much more fun when I think I can raise hell and go to heaven after it's over, right? I mean, life's so much better now. That's what I, I think we hear a lot. And, but, uh, man, my problem is I read the Bible every once in a while. And, and I wanted to make sure I was right about this because I think this is an important message, the most important message the preacher ever gives. And so I wanted to make sure I was right. And so I read back through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John this week, and I took my yellow highlighter, and I highlighted uh, when Jesus is talking about this. And, and I want you to know this, that as I read what Jesus says, Nothing that Jesus says about belief sounds like a cheap one-way ticket to heaven. It sounds very different than that. All right, let, let me give you one example over here in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. It says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Large crowds are following Jesus because he's healing people and feeding people. And it's kind of like a circus sideshow. Everybody wants to be a part of it. And, and these large crowds are following him around. It's a perfect time for Jesus to offer one-way tickets to heaven to everybody who simply believes that he's the Son of God. But instead of doing that, Jesus turns to this large crowd and he says to them, if you don't hate your father and mother, your brother and sister, you cannot be my disciple. He, he's simply saying, if you don't love me above your own family, you cannot be my disciple. He says, if you're not willing to carry your cross, if you're not willing to understand that following me means at times you'll suffer, if you're not willing to carry your cross, you can't be my disciple. I, I just want you to know what it means because you guys are following me. And before you make a commitment to follow me, I really want you to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He kind of put the whole thing out there for them. He said, listen, this is what it means to receive the life that I want to give you. And, and then he went on to say this. Suppose one of you wants to build a, a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a, delegate, a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. And you read through the scriptures, and Jesus says this kind of stuff all through here. He, he, says, he says, count the cost. Count the cost. Jesus didn't offer cheap one-way tickets to heaven. He invited his followers. He invited his followers to be his disciples. He invited them to be born again and to receive a new life. Jesus invites us to be born again, to die to this old life, characterized by ungodliness and powerlessness, were to die to this old life and to receive this new life that Jesus wants to give us. And, and Jesus says, hey, if you want this, if you want to be my disciple, count the cost. And, and for some of us, that sounds odd to count the cost of receiving Christ as our Savior because we've all heard that salvation is free, and it is. The life that Christ offers us doesn't cost us anything. Christ died to make that possible. But, but if you receive that life, you're going to be born again, which means the old life is going to die. Something is going to go away. And if you want to hang on to that old life, if you want to keep on doing what you've always done, and you just want, you just want a cheap one-way ticket to heaven, Jesus said, that's not it. That's not what it means to believe. Jesus wants to give you a new life. And this new life is radically different from the old. And so he says, count the cost because that old life is going to go away. And he's going to give you a brand new life that you didn't pay for, that you didn't buy, that you didn't earn. He's just going to give it to you. But count the cost. This new life is different. It's characterized by words like submit, disciple, sacrifice, servanthood. This new life is radically different from the old life. 
the old life, the scripture says you were dead. The, 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 this new life, it says you're now alive. I, I go to a lot of funerals, and, and when people walk up to the casket at funerals, it's inevitable that somebody looks in that casket and says, don't they look great? And I say, yeah, they look great, but they also look dead. I mean, I've not seen a person in the casket yet that didn't look dead. Uh, and they don't look bad, but they look dead. The life is not in them anymore. And thank God that they're, they're now with the Lord. But listen, they don't look alive anymore. And there's a radical difference between a dead person, even with makeup on, looking good in their hair comb, there's a radical difference between a dead person and a live person, isn't there? And this new life that Christ wants to give you is a radical new life. And he's offering it to you, but he's simply saying, hey, if you take this, I want, I'm going to give you, it's free, it's yours, I've died for this to make it possible, but just count the cost because the old life is going to go away. And if you just want a cheap one-way plane ticket to heaven so that you can go about your old life, then you don't get it. That's not what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. It's not, I, mean, I care about this. I care about this because I want to be in worship with you guys like a thousand years from now. I mean, I, I think this life is so short. I mean, it's over just like, I mean, I want to be in worship with you guys a thousand years. We'll still be worshiping together. Uh, and, and that's, I just like that thought. You know, and, and yet, I read in my Bible, and, and I don't necessarily like it, uh, but, but it's in there, that not everybody's going to go to heaven to be with God forever. You may not like it, but you're not God either. And, and I can't find a way to read this any other way. Not everybody's going to go. And, and it hinges on our understanding of what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. And, and, and I've done too many funerals for people where, where somebody, you know, they, they walked up in front of church when they were 12 and they've, they've totally lived this ungodly, horrible life all their life. And, and the family comes to me and says, hey, yeah, he was horrible. He did all this terrible stuff. He was a bad person, but, but he got his ticket when he was 12. And listen, when a family tells me that their loved one is saved and has a relationship with Jesus Christ, I believe them and I preach that sermon because they know their loved one better than I. But I hope that somebody told their loved one somewhere along the way that belief in Jesus Christ is not a cheap ticket to heaven. Because that's not what it is. It's something more than that. All right? So, so what does it mean to believe? Uh, I think uh, it's, it's important to kind of illustrate this because I want you guys to get this. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got a paintball gun right here. I'm very good with this. Now, I've also got a styrofoam cup right over there on that chair. All right? And how many of you believe that I can hit this styrofoam cup that's over there on that chair with my paintball gun from right here? I have a little faith, a few of you. All right, a few of you believe, a few of you believe, how many of you are willing, of those of you who believe, how many are willing to put this cup on your head and let me shoot it off your head? Mike, you believe, brother? Come on up here. Man, I can't believe that. Somebody believes. All right, well, let's be safe, though, Mike. All right, have a seat right there on that stool. There you go. Put that on. You said you believed, right? You're here by your own volition? <laughs> I'm really going to shoot you. You understand that? Okay. <laughs> okay, hold on to this. All right, I'll get you set. Okay, wait a second here. Let's get you good and ready. All right, you, you change your mind? Nope. All right, now be real still. All right, real still. He said, y'all heard him, he said it was okay, didn't you? All right, hang on. Uh, yeah, yeah, wait, wait a second, my glasses are fogged up. Oh, oh, I missed, hang on, wait, wait. Oh, wait, hang on, hang on. Right, I'm going to get it. Ooh, oh, I almost got it. Oh. Ah! <laughs> Thank you, Mike. You're crazy. Nobody should do that. Nobody should volunteer for stuff like that. You got to have faith, brother. That's right. Now. <laughs> now. 
Now, those of you who believed from your chair that I could shoot the cup, you have the faith that the demons have, all right? Because guess what? The demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The devil believes that Jesus died on the cross. The devil believes that on the third day Jesus rose again, all right? The devil believes all that stuff too, right? But the devil is not going to see the kingdom of God. One person in here that I could see believed. <laughs> it's the person who's willing to stick the cup on their head, right? I mean, that's who believes. And when we get to the Scripture, that's what it means when John 3, 16 says, Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's not talking about head knowledge. It's talking about those who trust him with their life. To believe in Jesus Christ is to believe he is who he said he is. It's to believe what he did, that he died on the cross for your sins, and that he lived so that you might have life. It's also to trust him with your life. To believe in Jesus Christ is not to receive a cheap plane ticket to heaven. It's saying yes to being his bride. It's saying yes to being made new. It's saying yes to being born again so that your life is radically oriented around God and not around self. It's saying yes. Saying yes to recover what was lost so long ago in the Garden of Eden when we chose to serve ourselves over God. It's to say yes to Christ. That's what it means to believe. It's not just a matter of the head. It's a matter of what we do with our lives. It's to say, yes, Christ, I, I accept this life that you give me knowing that my old life is going to go away. It's to say yes to God's grace making us brand new, transforming us from the inside out. And the result of saying yes to Christ, not the cause of it, but the result of saying yes to Christ is that day by day, sometimes gradually, sometimes by leaps and bounds, day by day we become more like Christ. That's what happens. But it happens because we said yes to him. We said, yes, Christ, I, I, I want to be your disciple. I receive the, the life that you freely give to me, recognizing that that, that old life is, is, is going to go away. I counted the cost, and I said yes to being a disciple. People say, well, how do I know that I'm saved? I mean, if it's not, if it's not the fact that I prayed a prayer when I was 12 years old, how do I know? I mean, where's the assurance? Because God, God wants us to have assurance, I, I think. I don't, don't think God wants you to wonder whether or not you have a relationship with God. You're right with God. How, how can I know that? Well, well, Jesus answered that question, too. You can take a look right here at these pictures I've got up here. What kind of tree do you think this is right here? It's an apple tree. It's a bad picture. I should have used a better picture, all right? It's an apple tree. Look at the next tree. What kind of tree is that? It's an orange tree, isn't it? Yeah, what kind of, what kind of tree is this? It's a what? How do you know it's a banana tree? It's got bananas on it, right? Uh, you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, you know a tree by the fruit it bears. And it's pretty simple. You know, what, 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 you know the kind of tree by the kind of fruit that's on it. Jesus said, listen, we'll know that we're disciples of Christ by the life that's being formed in us. We'll know that we're disciples of Christ not because of, of a decision that we made when we were 10, but because we look at our life and say, wow, the old is going away and the new is being formed day by day on a daily basis. God is reorienting me so that my life is around Him and not around myself. And I'm not yet who I'm going to be, but I'm not who I was last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I see the life of Christ being formed in me. I'm becoming like Him. There's more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and self-control in my life than there were five years ago. I see the fruit of those things. And, and when, when that's happening in your life, when you're more loving and joyful and patient and peaceful, all those things, that's because Christ is working in you and the assurance that you are His child is simply by the life that you now live. It's a new life that looks radically different from the old life. Dead and alive don't look the same. It's not that hard to tell. And your assurance that you are a child of God is simply that you're coming to life day by day. You're coming to life in Christ. How do you come to be right with God and to see the kingdom of God that begins today and lasts for eternity? You believe. That's it. 
Do you believe? Which means you believe in your head he is who he is, who he said he was. And you say yes to the new life that he wants to give you. You count the cost. You realize that the old is going to die. And you say yes to receive that new life that Christ wants to give you. And when you do that, you know what happens? All of us who have done that, we discover what Paul discovered. That that old life was rubbish compared to the new life that we found in Christ. I mean, these things that we hold on to, uh, these things that we grab on, that, that we think bring life, that we think bring joy. When we let those things go and we just let Christ transform us, we discover man, that, that, that stuff, that old life. It was just rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus and being his child and being his disciples. Believe in Jesus Christ, and you will not perish, but have eternal life. Let me pray.